Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast at the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. The great question which we have to consider is whether the time has not now arisen for the creation on this Australian continent of an Australian government and an Australian parliament. Surely what the Americans have done by war, Australians can bring about in peace. That was Sir Henry Parks, one of the fathers of Federation, delivering his famous Tenterfield Oration in 1889. Australia's Federation has conventionally been characterised as the greatest political achievement in Australian history. But was it really just a collusion of empire-minded elites, focused on their own power grab rather than getting the model of Federation right? Joining me to discuss the history of Australia's Federation is Dr William Coleman, formerly a reader in the School of Economics at the ANU and now an adjunct at Notre Dame University in Fremantle, Western Australia. Lovely to have you on Afternoon Light, William. Thank you so much, Georgina, for the opportunity. This is a fascinating topic and I fear understudied the history of our Federation. You've written a book, Their Fiery Cross of Union, a retelling of the creation of the Australian Federation, 1889 to 1914, which takes a very different view of Federation from the sort of conventional wisdom, particularly that, I guess, promulgated by historians like the late John Hurst. Tell me what prompted you to write this book? Well, I could give you a moment. I was sitting there, I think it was at a meeting of the Economic Society, and one of my colleagues just said with an exasperation, words to the effect that I wish 1901 had never happened at all. <laughs> this colleague is a very impressive one, a very serious one, not one given to any sort of facetious comments. And it was almost a little moment of epiphany. Up till that point, I'd always accepted Federation as simply part of the civic religion, and I was then sort of challenged. And I began to think. But I'd been prepared for that sort of moment of epiphany. I'd been prepared by the work of John McCarthy, who 50 years ago pointed out the essential redundancy of Federation at that point in time, in 1901. I had become quite disconsolate about the possibility of turning Australia's sham Federation, which had become a sham Federation, with some clear exceptions, into a real Federation. And I have to say, finally, living in Canberra, as I had been for some years, seemed to bring home to me in a palpable way the thought that Federation, as it had worked out, wasn't really a distillation, if you like, of the six component parts of the Federation, sort of distillations of their essence. It was a more external thing. It was an almost attempt to, to change the essence of that society. And living in Canberra gave me that feeling. I mean, we have 400,000 people living in the middle of nowhere, living in, for the most part, in certain affluence, right, thanks to the rest of And do they in any way represent or share our feelings? Well, we know the result of the voice referendum throughout Australia. All states rejected it, 60% overall. We know that in Canberra, of its 120 booths, all but five of those booths voted yes. Okay. I was recently there for Australia Day. I visited the National Library. Of course, there's a controversy over changing the date of Australia Day. When you go to the National Library, you almost cannot turn a page without an acknowledgement of country, an acknowledgement of elders, et cetera, et cetera. But the National Library of Australia will not acknowledge that it is Australia Day. The National Library of Australia refers to it as the 26th of January public holiday. Okay. Now, we know that only 21% of Australians support changing the date, thanks to the YouGov poll. So I believe that Canberra almost epitomises how Federation has gone wrong. It's almost an external force trying to change Australia rather than express Australia. So sitting in Canberra, feeling frustrated that Canberra seems out of touch, and I guess you wrote this book, of course, before COVID, didn't you? So these were reflections that didn't come out of another sort of moment in our federation where we really all experienced firsthand federation and the power of the states, but also that disconnect between Canberra and the rest of the country. So you identified that there was 
in that period leading up to Federation, a lot of things that could have been done better and a lot of things that were going wrong. Can you paint a picture for those of our listeners who aren't terribly familiar with Australia as it was pre-Federation, so six different colonies? What was the governance structure? How did the colonies all interact? What was the status of pre-Federation Australia? Well, pre-Federation Australia was really pre-Federation Australasia with no distinction between New Zealand and the other six. Each of them had been essentially obtained self-government around about the time of 1856. So they governed themselves. All of them had, by the time of Federation, just about introduced manhood suffrage and South Australia and soon Western Australia was to introduce adult suffrage. They were democratic and free societies. But they were in themselves, they were unitary states. Each of them was a little unitary state with little sense of local government. So in terms of what the federations were taking to the Federation Convention, they were taking what they were used to. Each came from a unitary self-governing state. And they were going to replicate that in the large. That was the outlook. Do you think that then Federation itself was necessary or could we have kept going along with a six or even more unitary states? I think the point is in 1901 there was no call to federate, right? It was unlike, say, 1867 when Canada federated. Of course Canada had to federate. The United States, which for 30 years had really been paralysed by a north-south controversy, had suddenly become a powerful country right? You need it under a victorious north. Canada had to itself respond to that unity south of the border with their own unity. There was no such pressure or circumstance in 1901 at all. I do believe it would have been more fortunate for Australia if closer political integration had come, maybe with the outbreak of the First World War, when there would be a necessity, right? And indeed, in a somewhat ad hoc manner, right? rather than in this sort of rather grandiose marble constitution, which we have. What about these bodies like the Federal Council and the legislation that was underpinning that, like the Australasian Civil Processes Act, the Federal Garrisons Act, the Australasian Naturalisation Act and the Australasian Testamentary Processes Act? Did they provide a sort of pre-confederation that we might have been able to get away with, do you think? The Australian Federal Council was a legislature created in 1885 and existed for 15 years until abolished by the Commonwealth of Australia Act of 1900. It passed various acts, which were quite useful, like mutual naturalisation, being able to present a writ from one colony in another colony, which is obviously vital for all sorts of practical purposes. And yet it was limited by the fact that it was not elected, right? Election means legitimacy. And if you're not elected... You can't press the button too hard on any issue, really. Now, people I write about the book, the Premier of Queensland, a man called Burns, was very interested in turning the Federal Council into a genuinely federal body, which would therefore displace the possibility of the Commonwealth of Australia. And his first task was to democratise it and to make sure that it was elected. He took that proposal to the last meeting of the Federal Council in 1898 But the last thing the Federationists wanted was a federal council revivified and restored and legitimated. So they busied themselves in defeating that proposal. So I think that a reformed federal council could have provided a kind of confederal system for ruling Australia, for providing a post of political integration, which I think would have been more genuinely expressive of Australia. But we will never know, but that's my thought. We won't. With this Federal Council, though, how are the people on it selected then if they weren't elected? Were they just appointed by the various colonies? Or? Well, they were appointed by the relevant premiers, I mean, in theory, by the relevant governors, but in fact, by the premiers. So it was an appointed body. We're very familiar with appointed bodies, but it was sort of lacking in sort of legitimacy, really big task by the fact that it wasn't. So... The proponents of federation, people like Henry Parks, for example, and you in your book, I guess, do some little profiles on quite a few of the key figures who were pushing for federation. What were the arguments they were using to try and convince people that federation was a good thing for the colonies, a good thing for Australasia? Well, with respect to Parks, his very first punt in the 
Titterfield address, which you referred to, was to create a fear of a Chinese invasion, mm. right? Indeed, he had a friend, the British commander of the British garrison in Hong Kong, had very cynically written to Parks, saying that I could arrange for several Chinese battleships to come floating down towards Australia, and wouldn't that do your Federation cause a, a good stimulus? So he tried that, but these letters, these very cynical letters written by the commander of the British garrison in Hong Kong to Parks were published, and that sort of discredited the, the Chinese invasion gambit. Parks's great argument was for unity, for a kind of process of integration, was the crimson blood. We are British, right? That's what unites us. We are all Britons, and how can Britons be divided? This was his argument. And, of course, that's totally distinct from the attempt to present Federation as an exercise in Australian nationalism. No, it wasn't. The first pride of all Federationists was a pride in being British. But why was Federation going to deliver that rather than remain the colonies of Australasia? I mean, why was Federation a protectant? I think they passed these anti-Chinese acts, didn't they? And the white Australia policy itself had its origins in the Intercolonial Conference Resolution of 1888. So you've got all these sort of sentiments coming out. But why was Federation the panacea to that? Well, with respect to immigration, I think it was relatively, relatively low-key course. As you pointed out, anti-Chinese legislation had been introduced about 10 years before, which was quite severe and which had greatly reduced Chinese immigration. So while white Australia became an article of the new federated Australia, it wasn't especially prominent in the federal courts. You ask me, why were they arguing for federation? Look, it was so much rhetoric, right? A nation for a continent, a continent for a nation. You know, this sort of thing. This doesn't, and Bart was quite clear. He told Bernard Wise, look, when you visit Tasmania, keep off arguing. Just stick to sentiment. And I'm sure that was quite wise. Because in terms of, shall we say, sober argument, sober benefit, it wasn't really there to be had. So you think it was really just a kind of a painting a dream of some, I don't know, unified utopia rather than actually presenting some concrete arguments that would demonstrate an improvement in people's lives with the advent of federation? It was not a solution to a problem, right? Let's, let's say that quite clearly. It was not a genuine solution to a general problem. It was an exercise in uh, grandiosity, really. Uh, it's, it's an exercise in the elite making careers for themselves in a grand sort of way rather than using government to solve real and pressing problems. What about this appeal, William, though, to free trade, that we needed federation to facilitate free trade between the states, the colonies? Was that a furphy? It was indeed a complete furphy. The first thing we should realise is that New South Wales was free trade. I mean, indeed, under George Reid, who was Premier, under his scheduled tariff policy, which is in legislation, by 1900, New South Wales will be strictly free trade, save for some duties on tobacco and tea and opium. The rest of Australia could export to New South Wales without the slightest difficulty. As for the other colonies, they did have tariffs. They were minor. Generally speaking, they were minor. So the suggestion that Australia was divided by great tariff hurdles prior to Federation is a myth. Is it true that the three largest colonies actually traded more with the world than each other? And if that is the case, did that not come from a sense that it wasn't easy to trade between the colonies? Or was it just that they didn't have anything necessarily to trade with each other? <laughs> the latter, certainly. Right. I mean, essentially, for a large part, they were replica economies, yeah. weren't they? They all um, were resource-intensive and exported resource-intensive exports. Similarly, we had little to do with New Zealand economically, right? Because, again, it was just a replica economically. So that's a real reason why they didn't really trade too much with each other. And these appeals to Australia being a sort of unified entity and therefore you know, would have greater independence and that sort of patriotic sentiment, clearly they're 
paint the federationists are painting this sort of great unified picture of, of a federated Australia of the Commonwealth of Australia. But I mean, was that actually the case when it came to how they were planning to create the federation? Well, I mean, they certainly painted pictures. And indeed, that was part of the rhetoric, I guess, which they used. I mean, the sad fact is that federation did not bring Australian unity. The first 14 years of the Commonwealth were riven by disputes between the former colonies, um, sectarian disputes, really reached a climax. Industrial disputation reached a climax of the general strike in Brisbane in 1912. It was not a, some sort of happy swords into plowshares shares sort of experience, the first 14 years of federation by any means. And it's pretty concerning too that it was not at all controversial, was it, that the constitution that was eventually adopted actually granted the British monarch the power to disallow legislation, so hardly making Australia a clearly independent federation. <laughs> this is very important. But perhaps the greatest myth in this about federation is that it was somehow Australia's independence. Certainly not, and nobody ever said it was at the time. Australia remained a colony, a self-governing colony, according to the Constitution of Commonwealth of Australia Act. And reflecting that, yes, even if the Governor-General signed, assented to legislation, it could be rejected by the Queen on advice of the ministers, of course, within two years of it being passed. Okay, so certainly the colonial status of Australia in the new Constitution was very clearly underlined and and challenged. And this wasn't particularly controversial. People didn't take issue with that, that we would be or potentially could be dictated to from London? This was my point. The Commonwealth of Australia wasn't going to be a nation state. It was going to be a nation colony. Okay? All the federations just accepted as a matter of course that Britain is the boss. Deacon, who was probably less... British in time than some others, wrote at the time, Australia is a dependency, okay? As for our first Prime Minister, Barton, he said in the first Parliament, the Commonwealth can have no foreign policy. Foreign policy, Britain tells us what to do on foreign policy. Indeed, he didn't want the Commonwealth to have a navy. Why do we need a navy? We've got the Royal Navy for us. <laughs> so they took it for granted that the Commonwealth would be a nation colony. So those proponents of federation, they were talking about the possibility of Australia needing some sort of defence force, weren't they? But this, in the end, didn't end up being the aspiration of those who eventually took charge. Deacon was interested in it, but Barton had no interest in it. So Barton and his Defence Minister Forrest, former Premier of Western Australia, were quite clear there would be no Australia. They will just rely on the British. How had the Australian colonies then prior to Federation organised themselves in terms of their contributions to the military engagements like the Boer War and others that were pre-Federation? Well, for the most part, they ran their own shows. So they had their own ground forces. Most of them had their own sort of small coastal sort of rather than blue water navies. With respect to the Boer War, they also ran their own show by and large. But there had been, and this is an important detail, some integration prior to the creation of the Commonwealth, simply through cooperation. One example of this is the Royal Australian Artillery, which dates from prior to the Federation, because that was something, artillery is an expensive, capital-intensive thing, especially training. They want to duplicate training. The colonies got together and created this Royal Australian Artillery, sort of bringing out that of course the colonies cooperated. They cooperated on many things, and they could have cooperated even more on defence, but history cut it short. A lot of the, I guess, arguments for federation are that Australia benefits from competitive federalism, and this was one of the arguments put forward by those proposing federation. Was that actually ever, do you think, a legitimate argument. I mean, we've ended up not having much competitive federalism at all, really, and vertical mm. fiscal imbalance has meant that <laughs> the states really do a lot of asking for income but not generating their own income. <laughs> the states, by and large, agencies of the federal government. 
we don't have, and the federal structures are really anti-competitive structures, right? Whenever you see a national council or national board with all the premiers and prime minister or ministers, that's there to, to sew something up, right, to stitch something up between them, right, to prevent competition, to close down the possibility of competition. And this so-called national curriculum that Rudd introduced, it's a good example of that. We can't have some states having better curriculum, more advanced curriculum than others, can we, right? So, yeah, we now have an anti-competitive federation. Of course, a genuine federation would not be like, right? But we have, for the most part, a sham federation, regrettably. And do you think that has resulted in a different outcome in other federations, like, for example, the United States of America or in Canada, where their states perhaps have more ability to offer different sets of educational arrangements, taxation arrangements and the like? (laughs) The passion for uniformity is extraordinary. I mean, just take bicycle helmets, right, on Porsche bikes. The law is the same, I believe, God, the tiniest, almost the tiniest detail in every state. Now, you look at the contrast with a dozen or so provinces in Canada, right? In some provinces, there's no requirement for bike helmets. In other provinces, it's like Australia, everyone has one. In other provinces, you have to be over 18. In other provinces, again, there are some situations you require them, some which you don't require them. That seems to me to be a genuine competitive federalism as the provinces try out different ideas, right? And in a topic which is not without controversy because, you know, there is the idea that bike helmets actually encourage risky behaviours and end up with more injuries than without them. Yeah, so that's Canada is an illustration of competitive federalism. Australia is an illustration of sham federalism. What is it about the Canadian system that makes it a good example of competitive federalism versus the Australian example then? What's the nature yes, of their is. system? Of course, they have Quebec, right? I mean, I think this is just a basic fundamental about Canada. The Quebecois would never in a thousand years agree to a simple unitary Canadian state. So I think that's terribly important. Geography is also terribly important in that it's, Canada is more geographically diverse. Remember, Australia is essentially a large island, right? Canada is not. It's strung, off, strung across a continent between two oceans, connected only, only by railways and, and highways. Yeah, I think it's just a more diverse country, geographically and culturally, which has made it a genuine federalism more possible. One of the things I've found fascinating reading your work, William, is how undemocratic the process of towards federation was that it, you know, <laughs> I think there was of the 54 delegates to the convention, 19 of them, so yeah, 19 out of 54 were absent for a, a quarter of the proceedings, so I just didn't even bother turning up. I mean, that's I haven't got the percentage of what 19 out of 54 is, but it's probably about 40% just didn't turn up. You had these block voting arrangements where each elector got 10 votes. So, again, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seems a bit rigged. Yeah. It was a winner-takes-all system to elect a national convention, which met in 1897 and 1898, a winner-takes-all system, which is very unfair. So in Victoria's case... The Argus ran a kind of particular block of candidates they supported. That was the free trade paper in opposition to the age. That won 25% of the votes. That particular block of candidates, which were pressed by the Argus, they won zero of the 10 positions. Okay? a very unfair system indeed. I mean, that's extraordinary. And, I mean, you were talking before about sectarian issues being rife back then. I noticed that only three of the delegates were Catholic, which meant that Mm. the vast majority were not. So their voices and opinions were basically not included. And what about the way the votes were counted in places like Western Australia and the Riverina electorates? And the sad truth about 19th century elections in Australia, and of course many other places, is that corruption was rife, okay, just endemic. And this has been noted at some length by all the relevant historians of the period, and I'm afraid they did not exclude the federal elections. Alas, sadly, and particularly in Western Australia, and we also suspect a good reason to think in New South Wales. I mean, one of the very odd, peculiar, disturbing things about the 1899 referendum 
the second referendum in New South Wales, the referendum which won the day for the Federationists, said there were no scrutinies, zero. Okay? I'd like the other. That's sort of weird, isn't it? Right? To have an election without scrutiny. <laughs> a sort of secret count of the votes. Yeah, it certainly wouldn't fly these days. I think any election monitorer worth his or her salt wouldn't be giving that a stamp of approval. It was a free and fair election, that's for sure. And the other issue too, William, was that more people didn't vote who voted than who voted. So, you know, you had a disengaged electorate, didn't you? Yes, you had a very disengaged electorate. Of course, what we really, I guess, want to look at is the number of people who enrolled compared to the number of people who voted. And you found that in many of the colonies, the number of people, at less than half the number enrolled, actually voted. There's a table in the book on that. I don't have it in front of me. But that is true for many of the colonies. In other words, what sort of mandate is there for federation when a majority of those who are enrolled don't even bother turning up to express themselves one way or another? Why do you think they didn't? bother? Was it because they didn't see the great benefit or great detriment to their lives? Didn't see any benefit. It's an interesting fact, I believe it's an interesting fact, that in the first decade after Federation, turnout for state elections exceeded easily turnout for federal elections. Okay, Turnout for federal elections was low, not only relative to state elections, but through, compared to the United States, their federal elections or England for their essentially national elections. For the first 10 years, the state government was where people had their feelings, right? Not in the federal government. They were indifferent, common. But if they had really, really hated the idea, they presumably would have turned out to vote against it, wouldn't they, William? So while they might not have seen a great benefit, is it? it's hard to argue they saw a great detriment, yeah? That's one way of interpreting not voting, just indifference. I mean, who cares? Yeah. Another way of interpreting it is, look, this is something I can't judge. I mean, people are essentially being asked in the referendum to judge a constitution. A constitution is a statute, right? That is a quite a lengthy statute, right? Parts of which have been described as incomprehensible by learned judges. Indeed, mysterious is another word. I mean, people confronting, and everybody was sent this statute in the mud. People confronting it could say, oh, look, I don't know what this is about. And they would vote, no, not out of indifference, but, whoa. That's going to be a problem, of course, with any massive constitutional change, which is one argument not to have massive constitutional changes, but to proceed gradually. People can sort of feel their way with it. So the fact that people might have felt they couldn't really judge this piece of legislation, this sort of, I don't know, it's often called the birth certificate of our nation in more grandiose terms than it probably deserves. <laughs> but so it definitely wasn't, you didn't get a sense that this was a grassroots movement for federation. This was a top-down movement of elites. I mean, the proponents of federation were barristers and judges. I and mean, I think of my great-grandfather himself, he had been a barrister participated in the South Australian delegation to the Constitutional Convention. That type of person was certainly not just part of the general community. That type of person was involved in politics, involved in law and educated, and they all really knew each other, didn't they, this group of people proposing federation? I agree. It was a top-down movement, very much so. It is also true to qualify that that it, the Federation appealed to what you might call the disgruntled margins, the geographical margins of Australia, right? So much of the disgruntled geographical margins, whether it be the north of New South Wales or the north of Queensland or the goldfields of Western Australia, were strongly yes, mainly out of resentment of their local city, be it Sydney, Brisbane or Perth. That was the one more popular shaft of the whole cause, These the disgruntled margins, but otherwise, I would agree it was very much a top-down movement, yes. So what was the nature of, of this milieu, this, I mean, really, people from the legal profession? Who were they? What type of people were they? I would say they were professionals. This is really the natural habitat of the Federation, the professions. First of all, the law, right, preeminently the law. And we just, as I point out in the book, 12 of the 20 delegates to the convention conference sent by New South Wales and Victoria, 12 of those 20 were lawyers, right? 
And of those 12, four ended up in the High Court. Okay. So we can see that this was very much a lawyer's uh, festival to some degree. But beyond the lawyers, you'd have to include the military men who had every interest in, a, in what Federation might hold. You have to include, by and large, the clergy. The clergy, by and large, were fascinated by it. Public servants, right? Public servants were very interested in this new form of government. And so you can see people who were very prominent in the campaign, such as Robert Garrett, okay, who really got very quickly rewarded and was made first secretary of the Attorney General Department on the first day of January 1901. So public servants were the, the fourth strand of persons very interested in the federal cause. What about the partisan issue? So, I mean, obviously this is pre the Liberal Party of Australia. We had the free traders, the protectionists and Labor. Where did those types of people sit or or was it not particularly a partisan debate? The free traders were split down the middle, right? Some free traders thought that Federation would actually be free trade. I don't know how they could have believed that, which is so opposite of the truth, the reality, which would quickly unfold upon Federation, but some of them believed it would bring free trade. Other free traders thought very differently. So free traders split right down the middle. The Labour Party was also split, but it was predominantly anti-Federation, right? And this comes back with your earlier suggestion that it was a top-down cause. The Labour Party then, different thing now, the Labour Party then was very much a bottom-up organisation, right? And they thought that, so the common attitude amongst the Labour Party today was that federation is just a fad. Federation is just a toy, and what we want is law on the eight-hour day, on coal coal mining regulation, et cetera, et cetera. Bread and butter issues for Labor Party voters. So the Labor Party, by and large, was against it, particularly, I might say, in New South Wales, but also in Victoria. The federation vote, as everybody knows, Victoria was pro-federation, but the lowest vote was always in the inner city areas, the industrial areas of Melbourne, yeah. And did Labor continue this anti-Federation point of view right through? I mean, this is you see this in their leaders through that period. It did until the course was won or lost, depending on how you look at it. As soon as Federation had been won following the 1899 referendums, the second round of referendums, the Labor Party... Perhaps you just call it political realism. Well, yeah. it's been done, so let's just jump into it. It is typified by Billy Hughes, formerly very anti-federationist, becoming a new member of the federal parliament, quickly becoming the leader of the federal Labor Party, and the Labor Party embraced the new federal structure. The federal Labor Party did very well in the very first election, it essentially controlled the balance of power, and within a few short years it created the first, famously, as all historians know, the first Labor government anywhere in the world, at least at a national level. So there's an irony there. The Labor Party generally was bitterly opposed to federation, and yet once it had happened, it was the great beneficiary. The proportion of Labor Party members as the total members in Australia's legislatures just rocketed after 1901. The Labor Party was just on a roll come federation. Yes, it's interesting, as you say, so, I mean, of course, Chris Watson being the key figure here, um, the first leader of a Labor national government in the world, how well Labor does in this post-Federation yeah. Australia. And non-Labor doesn't find it as easy to organise itself on this sort of grander national level as it had on the more colonial level, did it? The Liberal parties were essentially based on personalities, right? Small electorates. Queensland had divided into 76 electorates, not a large society in population, 76 electorates. With Federation, I think Queensland was reduced, what, had nine electorates, nine huge electorates. All of a sudden, knowing Tom down the street is a good fella is not going to work. What you want is branding. And the non-Labor parties did not have branding, but the Labor Party had a stronger branding. Oh, he's a Labor man, right? Right, I'm voting for him. I believe this was the great advantage of the Labor Party in those first 14 years, a sense of branding in these really large and impersonal electorates. 
But you did have the non-Labor parties, I mean, free traders and protectionists, they did have a set of ideas that they were advocating for. So there was a sort of sense of branding, whether you agreed with that position or not. Well, remember, they were split, right? There were the protectionist parties and the free trade parties. Now, later they tried to fuse. That was always sort of uncomfortable, right? So I think they were split in their policies. And I think that when you just compare the Labor Party with the various parties, which non-Labor tried to generate, the non-Labor parties are pretty feeble things, right? I think the sort of Jim Crack, low membership, while the Labor Party quickly had a sense of party patriotism about it. I do believe Labor's great advantage in those early days. Yeah, well, I guess that that link to the trade union movement as well gave it a really sort of solid foundation of organised support, didn't it? Yeah, the trade unions, yeah. The Federation is arguably a moment when Australia's character starts changing from obviously these sort of distinct six, well, at least on the Australian continent, the six colonies, and I appreciate there was a broader Australasia, but... You know, you'd have considered yourself a New South Welshman, a South Australian, a West Australian or a Queenslander, Tasmanian and the like, and there was a sort of a sense of loyalty to your particular home colony. What changed the character of Australia with Federation or did it not? Did we sort of live as little kind of colonies despite Federation? I believe we lived, in terms of mental consciousness, I believe that any Australian identity was quite a constructed and contrived, almost false thing until the First World War, right? Right. I think the First World War was the great forming sense of Australia as a nation, Australia as a country, and Australia as a real identity. We owe that to the First World War, not to Federation. Was there a sense that Australia was a utilitarian society back then? It's always been a sort of a critique of Australia or or perhaps it's a part of just our national character. It's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but in the sense that it's a big country, we need to do what's best for the greatest good and that's just a nice efficient way of making decisions and making decisions across such a vast vast geographic area, especially with a very dispersed population? I think it obviously that utilitarian efficiency ethos has been quite powerful in Australia. I cannot say that the Commonwealth served it. The Commonwealth integrated to six armed forces of the colonies with, with great confusion and disorder and waste. It integrated the six post offices of the colony with great disorder, confusion and waste. So I cannot see the Commonwealth in any way as an expression of a utilitarian impulse. I'm afraid I have to go the other direction. And I see it as largely just an impulse for grandiosity, right? right? Instead of all will be grand and great. Mm-hmm. What about the alternatives, William? I mean, if we hadn't gone down this route or, I mean, if we had gone down the Federation route but perhaps taken our time and refined the model a bit better, there's arguments that, for example, our Senate that we ended up with, our upper house is really too powerful and that it's an American model placed into a Westminster British system and it sort of doesn't really work in our system as a, I guess the proponents aspired it to work. It's certainly not a state's house, is it? And as Deacon said, look, it will always be a party house and that's what it has been. And, yes, it is so powerful. It's the most powerful of any parliamentary democracy in the world. It's so powerful that it can as we saw in 1975, extinguish the executive, effectively extinguish the executive. And so we have an executive with two masters, the House of Representatives and potentially the Senate. That's a very unfortunate situation. So, yes, we could have had just a less powerful Senate. At the same time, we could have done without double dissolutions, which are, I think, just a way of stretching out a crisis rather than actually solving a crisis. Look, I think what we could have done, if people think this is all a bit too counterfactual, a bit fanciful, we could have had, if you like, a minimal federal constitution. So it's a great list of powers, right? We could have just had defence, foreign or external affairs, it was what it been called, because it wasn't really foreign affairs, and possibly free trade. These three things could have been given to the Commonwealth, and more powers could have been added by a referendum later. It would have been 
sort of feeling as you go type way rather than this great thunderclap of a new system. Do you think that our referendum process is too difficult? I mean, we've had, what, 45 referenda and only eight have passed successfully, so it's clearly incredibly difficult to change the constitution and the result of the voice referendum in October last year shows that even when the early polls show that it's going to be a foregone conclusion, once the public get more and more opportunity to think about the consequences of a change to our constitution, they generally say, no, I I think we'll just stick with the model we've got, thanks. I think if you like a conservatism on part of the people with respect to any constitution is almost inevitable, all right? People don't understand what is being proposed. They're suspicious. Yeah. And I think it's a rational suspicion. If you don't know, you say, no, thank you. I'm not going to buy that. I think it's just a trouble with constitutions. Maybe that's the problem. We just have, what do I mean by that? Not to have a constitution, or perhaps not to have a written constitution in the way it is with Australia. And the other great defect about the referendum process in Australia is that it's owned by the central government. Right? Only the federal government, or its two houses of power, I should say, can initiate a referendum. I think that's quite unbalanced. I think, as in the United States, a number of states, say like four states, should be able to initiate a referendum. The experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, reminded Australia that state governments do have a fair amount of yeah. power over our lives, I mean, particularly when it comes to health but also policing and, in the end, to crossing state borders. All these things, I think Australia just thought, oh, well, you know, the Prime Minister, the the federal government can sort of sort that out. We have a federal health department. You need a passport to get out of this country or into this country and surely you can just go to Sydney when you want from Melbourne. Well, no, you you couldn't even leave five-kilometre radius of your house for a while in Melbourne. Was that not an example of the states asserting their power? And, I mean, maybe that the federation that we have does give states this sort of really, really strong set of powers that I guess does have some competitive tensions then. You can see how one state, say New South Wales, some commentators say dealt with COVID better than a state like Victoria, for example, which experienced the world's longest lockdown. I think there was a degree, a small degree of competitive federalism in having six states or eight states and territories deciding their schools, a certain degree of competitive federalism in which New South Wales was very moderately the best. I'm afraid Andrews was obviously the worst. Look, the federal government, which forbade Australians from leaving Australia, which is quite extraordinary, right? I believe no other country in the world actually forbade you from leaving the country. So I don't think we should fault the states too much for over heavy-handed response. The federal government, too, was very much in fault. The only thing, other thing I would observe is that if you were to adopt a policy of eradication, which in retrospect was a, a silly policy, that that wasn't perfectly clear at the time, if you would adopt a policy of eradication, you would indeed stop people flying from Sydney or Melbourne to Perth, for sure. Right, or indeed, I mean, from Sydney to Melbourne, etc. So, given that eradication was the popular policy, it was this lure, it was the magic beans, right, held out to the public, right. These strong controls, these heavy-handed controls on interstate crossing, were quite rational. It was the policy of eradication, which was the real mistake in retrospect. Well, William Coleman, thank you so much for reminding us all of how we did come to be a federation here in Australia and how it wasn't necessarily the miraculous achievement that most historians would assess it to be, that it had its flaws and that it perhaps could have been better. I think this has been a really useful conversation and I really appreciate your time on Afternoon Light. Thanks so much, Georgina. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook.